Hey everyone, David Terrace, partner at the Rawson Law Firm and head of our federal criminal defense practice. We're continuing our series today on PPP fraud, Paycheck Protection Program. What we're going to be talking about today are the specific crimes that are being investigated, charged, prosecuted, what crimes are people pleading to, that our clients are pleading to, that we're defending them in trial on, because PPP fraud is the general scheme, it's the uh, name of the task force, and it's the name of this grand element of a certain type of fraud as it relates to the PPP loan applications, but there are still long-standing specific charges, criminal charges that go into these and that are actually prosecuted and charged in these cases. Wire fraud is going to be the focus on the video of today. Wire fraud is not just in the PPP context, but in general, in white collar criminal justice and white collar criminal defense, wire fraud is the big one. It is by far the most commonly prosecuted. I've spoken in another video, not specifically as it relates to PPP fraud, but about wire fraud in general and why it is the go-to for federal prosecutors when it comes to charging decisions in financial crime cases and these kind of allegations. We're gonna talk about the elements of wire fraud. We're gonna talk about the potential penalties for wire fraud. And then in a subsequent video, we're gonna talk about how the Ross and Law Firm, how myself and my partners defend against wire fraud cases in the PPP fraud context. So in the context of wire fraud, comparing it specifically to PPP fraud, there are a lot of different ways depending on the circumstances and the fact of the case that wire fraud is brought. Most commonly, it is in the application for the PPP loan itself, because usually if the government is bringing these cases, there is some sort of fraudulent misrepresentation, some, some sort of scheme, a plan to defraud um, a government institution, defraud the government by false representations, there's a scheme, okay? in order to induce them, in order to defraud the government into giving you something of value, the loan, okay? And in doing so, you used electronic devices, you used a form of communication um, that has the ability to travel across state lines, interstate communication. And very often, the material aspect, the material element is very often met because the amount of money involved usually in almost every case is going to be considered material but that's not to say that your case is shut and dry you need to come and meet with us so we can talk to you specifically how prosecutors bring wire fraud charges in the context of ppp so let's go down now into the four major elements of wire fraud the elements necessary to prove wire fraud are first that the defendant knowingly devised or participated in a scheme to defraud someone by using false or fraudulent pretenses, representations, or promises. Two, the false pretenses, representations, or promises were about a material fact. Material, remember that. Three, the defendant acted with the intent to defraud. The big one, intent. And four, the defendant transmitted or caused to be transmitted by wire some communication in interstate commerce or across state lines to help carry out the scheme to defraud or in furtherance of the scheme. Those are the four major elements. We're now going to break down each of the elements and talk about how each individual element of these main four actually play out in a PPP fraud investigation and prosecution. We're going to talk about in the next video how we defend against them, but pay very close attention here. And this video is very important because the defenses are inherently related to the language, the specific language of this charge of wire fraud itself. Because too many defense attorneys don't focus on word for word what actually is this crime. It's so overcharged. It's so broad. It is the golden child charge of the Department of Justice because they think they can get anybody for it. And that's why it's being used most commonly in PPP fraud cases. But you really have to understand it like we do at the Rawson Law Firm and break it down into its elements, into its individual 
context within any specific case. In a nutshell, before we jump deep into each individual element, just understand that at the end of the day, wire fraud is someone knowingly and voluntarily using some device that is capable of interstate or passing transmissions along state lines, usually an electronic device, cell phone, laptop, tablet, using email, something that passes along interstate wires in order to defraud somebody else. But this is why we're gonna go into the elements now because it's so much more than that. Taken on its face, this basic understanding of what it is does not help us when we're preparing our case, reviewing our clients' cases to actually beat these cases in the courtroom. So let's jump into the elements. So the first element is a scheme or artifice to defraud. So scheme or artifice to defraud. Someone cannot accidentally commit wire fraud, okay? There are defenses that we'll talk about where it could have been a mistake, it could have been in good faith, but there does, the statute does require, in order for you to be found guilty or to enter a plea, for the government to make a case against you, there has to be this concept of a scheme to defraud. Scheme does not have a real definition in the federal criminal justice system, but it's usually taken uh, as what it sounds like, and there are cases that have interpreted uh, the, the word scheme in different ways, but really what it is, is a plan. It's a plan to defraud somebody. It's a plan, and that plan can take many different forms, depending on the case, depending on the allegations and the circumstances, as far as what is the scheme or the plan to defraud. The scheme is very, very important here when it comes to understanding what the elements of wire fraud are and how we defend against these cases because each and every single one of the elements we're gonna discuss have to be proven beyond and to the exclusion of all reasonable doubt, the highest burden our government, our justice system offers, okay? By far the highest. So to prove scheme or to prove an artifice to defraud, what does the government really do in practice here in order to prove that? So on the intent and scheme to defraud element, in order to secure a conviction, the prosecutor must show that the defendant acted with the intent to fraudulently deprive someone of money, property, or something of value. Wire fraud cases are always gonna to have to have a scheme involved. A scheme to defraud is a plan a person employs that uses a statement, promise, misrepresentation, lack of statement, deception, or other kind of falsehood designed to deprive a victim of something of value. So in short, without all the legal terms and the legal mumbo jumbo, a scheme is a plan, a scheme to defraud is a plan to cheat somebody. Now, in all the different cases, there are many different ways that scheme can be shown. There are specific rules based on legal precedent about how the prosecutors can prove this element, how they can prove a scheme to defraud. When it comes to the scheme to defraud element of wire fraud, it's so important to have an attorney like us at the Ross and Law Firm who are very, very familiar and fight against these specific charges because it's very broad. It's too broad. We fight against that all the time, but the statute is what it is. Uh, there's a lot of room open to interpretation, which makes us as defense attorneys very upset. Uh, we fight for change on this because the law should not be open to interpretation. It's not right, it's not fair for our clients to know what it is that they are or are not facing when it comes to any one particular element that must be proven beyond and to the exclusion of all reasonable doubt. Just meeting one, two, or three of the four main elements we talked about here is simply not enough. So what's really important to consider about the scheme to defraud? Because this specific element has vast influence on the way that the rest of this statute, the rest of the elements in a wire fraud case are interpreted. Why does it say scheme to defraud and not fraud? The reason it says that is because all the prosecutors have to prove, and it's not that it's so simple, but what they have to prove and the way they crafted this language, which we of course disagree with and should be changed, but that's another matter entirely. But the way they crafted this language is that you have to have a plan 
to defraud somebody. You have to have a plan to commit fraud, but you don't actually have to have committed any fraud. And that is extremely important. It is why the prosecutors use this statute so much in so many different kinds of cases, because you don't actually have to have defrauded anybody or gotten any property of value or misrepresentations that led to you being unjustly enriched by successfully completing the scheme. The scheme just had to exist. The government has to prove beyond and to the exclusion of all reasonable doubt that there was a scheme, there was a plan to defraud somebody else of something of value. Another reason why it's so important for your defense attorney to understand the nuances of this word scheme and this one element is because the law actually says that the scheme need not have worked. The scheme need only have been designed or planned to harm someone, to deprive somebody else of their property or anything of value. It does not have to have worked. Our clients are prosecuted, they're charged just by having come up with a plan to do so. Now, the real linchpin of this statute is when we get down to the use of interstate wires or communications intended to cross state lines by some sort of electronic medium, which is what a wire is, okay, a cell phone, email, tablet, communications, text messages, very common mostly texts and emails. If you send the text, if you send that email and it was in furtherance of your scheme, according to the government and according to the established law, you have committed wire fraud. So you really, really have to not overlook any one specific element, especially when it comes to scheme. They have to show that there was a plan here. Not that that plan came to any fruition. Not that our client actually did harm another individual materially, only that they had a plan to harm them. So scheme to defraud, very, very important. We have to challenge it. We have to look very, very closely at the case itself, the facts, what our clients tell us, our own uh, evidence and our own defenses, the prosecutor's evidence and discovery, because that scheme has to be proven beyond and to the exclusion of all reasonable doubt. Now, how do prosecutors federal prosecutors prove scheme to defraud. Very important to consider. They do not have to show that every possible aspect of the scheme, every activity or every action which we call overt acts was actually accomplished. So if a scheme has, when well, the government's position is that a scheme has 20 different actions in order to complete that scheme, or at least that the plan uh, was to complete each of those 20 actions, then they only have to show one, sometimes more depending on the case, but they do not have to show that every aspect of a plan that they can put before a jury or a grand jury was actually successfully um, accomplished. They only have to show that parts or certain parts of the scheme, and again, that varies case by case, what parts they need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt or show through sufficient evidence are necessary to uphold a conviction uh, for the scheme aspect, which of course all four elements have to be met, so then in turn to uphold a conviction for wire fraud. Another very important aspect to consider when it comes to the scheme element of wire fraud is the government need not show that the defendant, the government need not show that our client was involved in every aspect of the scheme. Now, we're gonna be talking about in future videos, and I've made previous videos in the past about this concept of conspiracy. But even if we're not in the conspiracy realm, what the government has to show is that the defendant knowingly and willfully participated in the scheme. She need not have performed every key act herself. The evidence need only show the defendant was a knowing and active participant in a scheme to defraud, and that scheme involved interstate wire communications. The next element, element number two, and again, you'll see the fraud elements written different ways and in different order. The false pretenses, representations, or promises were about a material fact. Why is that so important? Material. Material is a 
huge, huge, huge important concept when we're going through the elements of wire fraud. The representations that you make as part of the scheme they have to be material representations. Basically what that means is they have to be enough where real harm could occur. Now the level of harm depends on a lot of different circumstances. That comes on a case by case basis. Remembering of course that the harm does not need to have been achieved, only that there was a plan to do harm and that the individual, our client is alleged to have used the wires, used interstate communication, text message, email, other forms of interstate wire uh, communications through electronic devices in order to achieve the purpose of the scheme, no matter whether any harm was done at all. But material, material misrepresentation is a very important aspect of this and a very important element because material is to the point where it actually has the ability to cause harm, to deprive somebody of value or other aspects of the element itself. So for example, our client comes to us and says, I made this application for a PPP, Paycheck Protection Program loan. In my loan, when I was making it, I was filling it out, I represented in the first portion of the loan where you have to certify certain things like your expenses, your payroll, the number of employees, the interest that you might have on your business, basically all the things the PPP program required our clients to say in the loan and everybody across the country requesting this loan why they were getting the loan. If someone were to put in their application that they had a payroll of $500, okay, and they didn't have that payroll. Is that material? Most of the law, most of the courts are going to say no. The prosecutor is going to have a really hard time defining that and proving that to a jury. Now again, every case is different. Usually it's not so easy or not so clear cut as $500. These loans were usually requested at a higher amount and the fraud or the scheme to defraud is usually for a larger amount than $500. But still, it has to be a material representation and the materiality of the representation, element two, cannot be overlooked. Element number three, and element number three is really, really the big one. We focused on the scheme element, we focused on the material element, but element number three is intent. Intent is everything in a wire fraud defense because it is very, very hard for the government to prove. It's allowed to be proved through circumstantial evidence. That means that there does not have to be direct evidence of intent. That's very hard to accomplish because we don't know what's happening in somebody's mind and that's really, unless they have confessed or they have put it in other form of writing uh, regarding what their intent was, very often it is not so easy for the prosecutors to prove intent beyond and to the exclusion of all reasonable doubt. And what is required in a wire fraud case, including the same thing for a PPP case that resulted in a wire fraud prosecution, is specific intent. Specific intent, not general intent. Specific intent is a very, very important concept you have to com uh, consider in the concept of idea of wire fraud generally and also as wire fraud is prosecuted in the realm of PPP fraud. Specific intent is interesting here and the government and the legislators have carved out a lot of ways to make it easier for the government, but still it's not something that we just roll over on, okay? Because it does require a substantial amount of proof. And it is very often only proved by circumstantial evidence. So how does specific intent work in wire fraud? You have to have the intent, the specific intent to commit a scheme or to plan a scheme to defraud. And in order to commit that fraud, have used interstate wires, electronic communications in order to complete the fraud, even if the fraud was not completed, even if the scheme was not completed and nobody lost a penny, the charge is still met there. But specific intent is really important here. One thing that's unique about wire fraud, as opposed to some of the other fraud crimes that we'll talk about in other videos when it comes to specific intent, is you have to have the specific intent to devise or to plan or to operate 
a scheme to defraud. Why is that important? No actual fraud, no act of fraud is even required for a conviction of wire fraud in federal court. The fraud does not have to be accomplished. The specific intent is simply related. It's not so simple, but it is related to the creation of the scheme itself and then use of the wires, use of interstate communications to accomplish that scheme. Again, regardless of whether it was in fact accomplished. So we fight intent very hard. It's nuanced. There is a lot of law that goes into intent. We're going to talk about how we defend that in, in later videos in this series, but intent is by far the most important concept, and it is a very difficult and nuanced concept for defense attorneys who are not versed in these elements, in the law surrounding these elements, like the attorneys, like myself, head of federal criminal defense at the Rawson Law Firm. The last element we're gonna address here, element number four, is the defendant transmitted or caused to be transmitted by wire some communication in interstate commerce to help carry out the scheme to defraud. Federal courts don't have jurisdiction over state court matters, okay? Very important concept. So the wire transmission itself has to be used in furtherance of committing the scheme. The communications themselves, the wires themselves, do not have to contain any fraud in them whatsoever. That's why this fraud is the poster child of Department of Justice uh, charging decisions in financial cases and specifically as it relates to PPP fraud as well because the text message could just be to someone about something related to the fraud but nothing in the text being fraud itself or not a misrepresentation itself they only have to show that a text message a communication that has the capability of traveling across state wires was used in some way in furtherance of this scheme that they also have to prove beyond and to the exclusion of all reasonable doubt. So when taking all four of these elements together, it is not so clear uh, that the government can prove this always beyond and to the exclusion of all reasonable doubt. We're gonna talk about, and the reason why, is because we're gonna talk about all of the defenses we have and how we at the Ross and Law Firm break down each one of these elements into their part look at the facts of your case and say, was this material? Was this a scheme? How far did this scheme go? Was harm intended? Because that's often inferred, but not always the case. Was harm intended? And we'll talk about that in the defenses as well. Were there mistakes? All of this has to be broken down, each element bit by bit. The focus for sure being, can they prove that our client had the intent to defraud? That's crucial in our defenses in these cases. And we fight them and we fight them well. It's so important to contact the Rawson Law Firm, to contact us as soon as possible, whether it's in the investigation or if it's already made its way to a prosecution, contact us because the penalties for wire fraud are very severe. Wire fraud is punishable by up to 20 years in prison and a $250,000 fine. Now recently, specifically in the way that these prosecutions have, be, have been brought in the COVID-19 disaster pandemic emergency, there's a specific part of this statute that says if the wire fraud occurred or was in relation to a national emergency, which a lot of courts are finding that the pandemic meets this concept, this legal notion of a national emergency, because it was declared by the federal government, the penalties are actually enhanced from 20 years to 30 years and $250,000 to $1 million. Okay, both of those, the incarceration and the financial penalty are both 100% on the table. You have to contact the Rawson Law Firm as early as possible so we can protect you from these very, very stringent, these very harsh penalties, which we do successfully all the time, and also because we have the expertise to break down this wire fraud statute to every single bit so that we can build the best possible defense for our clients.